and breathe. Gary Alcoholic. I've been sober since January 10th of 12, and I'm really grateful for that. And I know a lot, a lot, a lot of people are also really grateful that I'm sober. Um, I'm doing something a little different tonight, but let me start off by saying um, I got sober this time, January 10th of 12. Um, it was not my first sobriety date. I wish I could say I'm one of those people that came into AA and just really soaked up the knowledge and really just admitted I was an alcoholic. Found a power greater than myself, made a decision, did all these things to get involved in the program, and my story isn't just that way. So um, I'll start off. Um, a little couple of stats about me, um, and these are true stats. I've had over 100 plus jobs since the age of 15. I've had over 12 arrests, six relationships, one marriage, failed marriage, and one prison term. Um, my dad, my dad has had seven marriages, seven. Uh, four kids, and I recently learned that he was arrested more than a dozen times in a week. Um, clearly, you know, clearly it runs in the family gene pool. So um, here's a little bit more about me in detail. Me as a child. No, come on, don't you see the likeness? Come on, I mean, okay, it looks more like Pat Patrick Webster. I wish I looked at that belt when I was younger. Sadly, I wasn't. So I use this illustration uh, about Bam Bam and um, illustration literally, um, no pun intended and pun intended, to describe how I really thought about my alcoholism. I never really took it seriously. Um, I felt like if you only were going through the things I was going through, if you really understood me or poor pitiful me or all those things that we think about, um, I'm young, I've got the rest of my life to get my shit together and it started early on for me. I grew up in an um, middle, upper middle class family. We weren't rich, we weren't poor. Um, my dad and mom, neither um, fin uh, they both finished high school, but neither one went to college. Um, we were brought up in a modest way. My dad provided for us in a way that he, for things that he didn't have as a kid. Um, when I was a little bitty baby, um, I was a little really holy thing. And um, they would put my bow tie down here and call me uh, skinny, because they thought I was gonna grow up to be fat. Um, so nicknames are a big part of my story as well. Um, one of my earliest memories, um, my dad had a nightclub over on Ross Avenue when I was a kid growing up, and I remember going in there on Saturday mornings, and this is par like paramount in my story. Um, I would go in with my brother, and my dad would open up the doors, and I remember the smell of the booze and the cigarettes and all that leftover residue from the night before, and it was intoxicating to me, even at an early age. We go in, um, my dad had booze in there along with tables, and you know how we do when we get drunk, we reach out to get money in our pocket, and sometimes things fall out in the cracks of the booths. So my brother and I, great memory, would go and put our hand in the booths, and we would find 10, 15 cents here, a quarter there, blah, blah, blah. And when you're a kid, that's like a million bucks, so that's a fond memory to me, is that, that smell, that scent, and also getting rich at a, at a young age. Um, my dad, when I was growing up, had this necklace, and I'm wearing it tonight. I usually, for those of you who know me, I usually have my cross on and um, my um, uh, AA medallion. But I wore this tonight on purpose. Um, my mom gave this to my dad um, because he was also a, an alcoholic, just like her father. And it's St. Jude. It's the patron saint of lost and hopeless causes. So um, my dad's story and my story are a lot of parallels. Um, when I was a kid, I tell this story for another reason too. Um, I had bad grades, and um, or I thought I was being taken to a counselor for bad grades. But what initially happened was that I was imitating my mom and my aunt and flitting around and becoming the little Nelly uh, running around the house. So all of a sudden, my dad was taking me to boxing lessons and uh, learning how to play this and play football and all these things. He wasn't really hands-on with me at all, and. Um, they, the counselor told my mom and dad, you know, who does he spend more time with? And they said, well, clearly, um, it's not the dad. And so all of a sudden, my dad's trying to get me to do all this, this butch stuff. It wasn't who I was. Um, from my earliest memories, I remember looking up to guys. I think I always knew I was gay. Um, with that said, there was a neighbor nearby that I knew was gay because my dad had an eclectic group of people that they hung out with from the club and places like that. And this guy was known as... Um, uh, old not says, says his name is Ed, and, and um, he was a hairdresser that had a house around the corner. And in the sixth grade, I'll let you know how early manipulation started for me. I uh, created in my head and decided to carry this out to create a scavenger hunt by myself. And I, uh, 
I actually put things together. You know, you go to the grocery store and there's a, um, oh, the bags you put produce in that it's clear. And I got a battery and a uh, flashlight battery and a playing card and just a hodgepodge of stuff. In the middle of this um, list, I put Playgirl magazine. So um, I go over to this guy's house, knock on the door. It's a Friday night. He's having this little uh, Friday night party with other guys. I can hear disco music going. I'm probably, I don't know how old you are in sixth grade. But I knock on the door very hesitantly, and um, he opens the door, looks down. He's like, what do you, what's going on? I said, I'm on the scavenger hunt. He's like, by yourself. He thought that was kind of unusual. I'm like, yeah, this is what I have, and I've got everything except for this one thing right here. And he looks down at me like, really? Seriously? So um, he disappears in the house, and he's, uh, why don't you come in? Come in. I'm like, no, 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 I'll stay right here on the front porch. And um, as he was walking away, the door creak, kind of creaked open, and I could see him veer to the back of the house and snicker to a couple of guys, at which point they're like, hey, check out this little boy at the front door. You want some porn? <laughs> so... He disappears upstairs what it seemed like forever, forever, forever. And I'm standing there thinking, this is the time I should probably run. He's going to figure out who I am. He's going to tell my parents, yada, yada. And um, he finally comes downstairs with a brown paper bag. And he says, I think this will do you just fine. And um, I got down the street, pedaled my little uh, young ass off, and um, opened it up to find a honcho magazine. So <laughs> mission accomplished. Um, I find it ironic that um, a couple of years later, many years later, probably 10 or 15 years later, um, I was with some guy, um, one of my minis, um, who had a house uh, down downtown, and um, we were having, he was having a party and having people over for Sunday brunch, and we had already three sheets to the wind, and he said, oh, I'm jumping the shark, you know, answer the door and let people in. So as he did, um, I was meeting and greeting people, and of course, one of the people that showed up, he said, oh, my name is Ed blah, 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 and I'm like, Ed so-and-so, I said, do you remember back in the late 60s, somebody that came to your house and scavenger hunt? He goes, oh my God, you're kidding. So I ended up tricking with you and his husband. <laughs> so this goes to show. Sixth grade also was a time for me of uh, discovery. Um, there's always one person in a group that usually looks older. And back then, the drinking age was 18. Um, we were able to go buy beer and we went behind the local 7-Eleven and stayed back there drinking. Um, back then, a six-pack would annihilate anybody, especially if you're a kid. My best friend was a stocky big guy. He had like four beers, and I remember drinking beer and like pouring it out because I didn't like the taste. To me, I didn't like the taste. It didn't like anything it was doing to me, and uh, it was a turnoff. And then seeing him kind of schnockered and what have you, it was just not really appealing to me. So um, I find it ironic that I really didn't like the taste of booze early on. This quickly changed when I became 16 and able to drive my car. Um, as I mentioned, the drinking age was 18, and I found my way in and out of the clubs of Dallas. Um, my dad knew a lot of people, and um, I had a fake ID, and a lot of the people would just slide me in the door, not say anything, put me in the back booth, and allow me to drink. It wasn't long after that that I started having consequences of drinking immediately. Um, one of the first ones I can think of was um, I'd gone with a girl. Yes, I was dating girls back then. Um, to a bar out of European Crossroads, and um, we had had dinner, and um, we were having drinks. She went to the bathroom. You know, people go out to dance, and they set their drinks around the dance floor. And um, I had a big, what it was like a big pitcher of beer, and I'd already drank it. And I was going, to, you know, people had gone to dance. I'm grabbing their drinks and dumping them in mine. And it's not like I couldn't afford booze. It was just that's why my mind was geared. It's like I just want to get annihilated. On the way home, um, she was begging and pleading and pleading and begging, please, please, please don't drive. You're scaring me. She was crying, but I managed to get her home uh, safely. And um, around the corner, I did a Dukes of Hazard, went through three yards, hit a telephone pole, and kind of hydroplaned my car into a ditch. Um, the police were called. Um, I also, they, the neighbor that whoever I hit, uh, the pole, uh, called my dad. So he arrived shortly after the police did, and I was handcuffed in the car. Um, 17 years old, and um, they were going to take me downtown. I don't know what my dad said or did, but um, they let me go. When they were getting ready to let me go, I hurled on the police car, which really aggravated the policeman, and he was getting ready to take me again, but my dad persuaded him to let me go. So there were no consequences. Um, shortly thereafter, um, I was over at some leather bar over on um, Maple Avenue and uh, booze and lewds and drove home and uh, parallel parked my car in between two cars. And um, my parents just kind of chalked it off as, ah, he's young, it was just a mistake. So there were never any real consequences for my drinking early on. Um, my dad um, 
was a car dealer, so when things like this happen, I would just interchange cars like I did clothes. Um, my grandfather, my mom's dad, was also an alcoholic. Um, he and my grandmother by marriage had um, divorced, and he had finally found a way to get sober through AA and met this other lady through AA, and they got married. So he was sober until the day he died. He suggested I go um, check out an AA meeting. Um, I had already been to the hospital for alcohol poisoning, there were these wrecks, and all these weird things were happening off the bat. So I went over to the Alcoholics Anonymous Lambda Group on Executive Inn across from Left Field, and this was in 1980. I remember going in there, and I remember hearing a lot of laughter. There was a, the room was filled with smoke, and it smelled like coffee, and it seemed like it was a, just a group of old people. But I, I, it was like kind of watching Charlie Brown. I heard alcoholism, I heard hope, I heard wisdom, I heard serenity, I heard peace. But um, clearly that wasn't where my mind was at at that particular time. So I took a hook and went back to what I do. Um, shortly thereafter, I took another shot at it. My grandfather suggested Palmer Drug Abuse Program. It's where you go and they give you a monkey fist. And I um, shortly after that realized that Palmer Drug Abuse Program was a place that you could go to get drunk and get booze and things like that. So. Um, that's a real picture of me. And then this is a picture of me and my um, PADAP span, uh, sponsor at the time. He was that 70s kind of flair. I thought, ooh, this guy's a hottie. I had nothing to do with sobriety. I chose him because he was hot. There you go. Well, PADAP didn't actually work for me at all. Um, my dad put me through what else? Bartending school because I was good at drinking. And I finished bartending school. I got a job at the Wooden Nickel, which was one of the cabin bars where Old Plantation is now. Um, they put me in the front bar when you first walk in, um, so it was really the first thing that you saw when you came into the door. Um, it was a fun experience for me. I laid a, uh, made a lot of money, and I found it a little surprising that I was still living at home and going to high school and working a job to where you got off at 2, 3, 4 in the morning, um, especially over the you know, weekend was one thing, but during the week was another. Um, once a year, they would do what's called turnabout shows to where the drag queens that perform there on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday would bartend. This is a once a year deal, and the bartenders would, would do drag. So um, I was kind of pushed in this, you know, you got to do it, you got to do it. Not that I was, I think, too opposed to throwing on a dress anyway, but I did. And um, we did several um, little skits, and at the end of the night, they were giving out different awards. And um, I got two awards that night. Um, one was the LP, So Many Men, So Little Time. I got that one. Um, the other was uh, two mirrors, and for the life of me, I did not get it. Two mirrors, what were the two mirrors for? And it took years later for me to figure out two mirrors, that way I could see both my faces. This is how I was when I was sober, this is how I was when I drank. Um, shortly thereafter, the wooden nickel burned, and um, they sent me over to, or got shifted over to the fraternity house on Fitchu. Um, I bartended there for a short time where I met my soon-to-be landlord and soon-to-be after that, ex-boyfriend, -hus husband. Um, I worked there for about six months to a year, lost the job, got a job nearby the house because um, my car was running uh, low on, I had already fucked up my car and a myriad of things going on. And I found a job at La Bear um, and Showtime Topless. Um, I was DJing at La Bear during the day. All right, ladies and gentlemen, coming to you live main stage. This is Tamika. <laughs> You know, I'm going in and I'm asking for a bartending job, and they're saying, can you DJ? And I'm like, no, guaranteed to put white caps in your waterbed. This is Lauren. And, you know, I just, I pulled it off. I did it. So, and it was free booze, and we got drugs, so that worked for a while. Um, I bartended at La Bear during the day, or bartended at Showtime Topless during the day, and then I go sleep in the pizza joint um, booth for a couple of hours, and then go to La Bear and do X and Eve and party all night, and I just pissed away my money, and that's how pretty much the 80s went. Um, I lost the job there, and I found a job at other scuzzy, sleazy, topless bars like um, Lipstick and uh, Showtime Topless, or what's the other Showtime? It was uh, Bear Facts over on Harry Hines, which were the rock bottom of topless bars. Um, they had bouncers and biker guys at the door just to keep everybody like the, the cooler. And um, they're always saying, you know, hey, if something happens, get behind me. And I'm like, you bet your ass. I'm going to get my money, and I'm going to tip door, and I'm going to hide behind you. But um, good money, I met um, a lady over there that actually coincidentally married my brother. Um, she was a topless dancer, and her and I were like fire and gas. Um, oh my God, um, we partied together for years, and we had quite a little system for partying. Um, during one of our little escapades, um, I remember we were out with her and um, her boyfriend, and um, 
another guy, and I remember us going to have drinks or something, and we were on the way back, and I'm in the back seat with this guy, and he kept grabbing my leg and grabbing my leg, and you know, I'm thinking, hey, this guy's turned on, he's wanting to, you know, blah, 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 so I get out of the car, and I'm trying to lay one on him, and fucking fag, you beat the shit out of me. Um, I went inside to find solace for my soon-to-be sister-in-law, at which point um, I'm annihilated, and so is she, and I walk in her condo, and she's standing upstairs, and I turn around the corner, and she's standing with the pistol, and she blows the shoots off the pistol, blows a hole in the wall next to me about six inches away from my arm and missed. It woke me up temporarily to run out the door. Um, I went down the street and there was a nearby dart station and um, I slept underneath a bus and got up the next morning and um, went to my mom's work looking like, you know, hell had bro all, all hell had broke loose and she's thinking, we need to have you committed. There's something really wrong with the situation. And, um, but we didn't. Um, I decided to do a geographical, so I'm thinking if I just got out of Dallas that things would change, so I moved to New Orleans. Um, I lived exactly, where else does an alcoholic belong? I went to New Orleans, you know, um, open 24 hours a day. Um, I got a place with my sister-in-law, the one that shot at me, we, 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 we kissed and made up, and I was going to help her move down there and consequently end up staying for almost a year. Um, we stayed out in Mattery, toward the very end, toward the jetty, and she got me a job at this seafood restaurant, and I thought, oh, I'll be self out here. I won't be able to get down in the quarter every night, and still I was down in the quarter every night and annihilated. Um, that little party lasted for about uh, six months to a year. What money I got, I'd send back to, to pay my rent at, behind the doctor's house, and um, sometimes I wouldn't, but he was ever so forgiving. Um, when I came back, um, the good doctor and I went together for, to, for dinner one night, and all of a sudden it seemed like that we had a lot to, to talk about and to connect. So everybody says I kind of graduated and went, moved from the little house into the big house. That marriage lasted about two years. Um, he was a gentleman and a really um, intelligent, articulate man, but he just could not seem to put up with my alcoholism. In my story, there's a lot of people throughout my life um, that I had really strong feelings and relationships with that literally were so patient with my, with my alcoholism, but sadly, um, they just couldn't see past the booze. Um, that's what the 80s looked like. Um, we lasted for about two years. Um, toward the end of the relationship, I had gone on a little weekend trip. He had bought a house because he wanted out from this monstrosity we were living in. Um, I got pissed off because he bought the house without me. It's his money. What, what, the, you know, what the hell? So I went to look at the new house. He was at work, and um, you know, people leave things behind. Um, there were lawn furniture and phone books and things of that nature, and I went through the house with another buddy of mine, and I'll teach you, and I trashed the pool. I literally threw everything I could find in the house in the pool, which ended our relationship. I moved to L.A., another geographical, thinking, hey, I'll be better out there. I can outrun my problems. And it was another blur of disappointments, um, alcoholism, drugs. I really don't remember a lot about Los Angeles, other than I worked at a bar called Keats and Oasis in the Valley. And um, a very sad existence. Um, I came back. I convinced my mom to allow me to move in with her. Um, she did, under the guise that um, she would not give me a key, so oftentimes when she would be at work, I'd just have to sit outside her house and wait for her to get home. Um, I found meager little jobs in and around where she lived just to work, and um, it wasn't proving to be um, the lifestyle that I wanted, so I decided to get it together on my own. I got a job at a hotel, and I managed to keep that job for a while. Um, one of the bosses there was gay, so he had a little bit more sympathy toward everything I was going through. Um, I got an apartment um, close to the bars, of course. That way I could walk or drive, which most of the time I drove. And um, I got DWI number one. Um, shortly thereafter, I got DWI number two. Um, these two that I got were so early on when DWIs were not as harsh as they are now that they were really slap on the wrist. Um, the first one was just like, oh, you did bad. Um, please go to AA twice a week and blah, blah, blah. The second one, they weren't so kind. Um, they were, you need to attend AA and occasionally pee in a cup, but it just wasn't, I think they really weren't up to speed where they are now. Um, I started dipping into crystal meth a lot. That's a big portion of my story. Um, I never really thought about how much it 
really was related to my addiction, but it really had a huge component to it. Um, in fact, I, I thrived on it. Um, one of the most brilliant concepts I had was to sell my car. I had this really cute little Toyota Cresta that had a dip in the front. But um, I thought, you know what, it's, it still had some value to it. And uh, if I got rid of that car, I could buy an eight ball. And then I could go to New Orleans where really nobody knows me and I could sell it. And then I could come back and I could live off this money, which is really kind of insane. And um, I made it as far as Shreveport in this little shithole station wagon thing that I bought after selling my beautiful car. And I got halfway there and thought, oh, this isn't going to work. And I went, turned around and came back. And you, you, you can guess the way the story went. I ended up doing all the blow myself, and there went the money. Um, let's see. Um, I went to work again at another bar, Big Daddy's, over on um, Cedar Springs. Um, again, no consequences for my second DWI. Um, they were selling X at the bar. Um, everybody there was doing drugs left, right, and sideways. I had a job, or a job I had an apartment over on Throckmorton. Um, car wasn't really running. Um, I met a, uh, a nice gentleman there um, who was from San Francisco, Sacramento, actually. And um, we had been trying to do this long distance thing. So he decides he's going to fly me out to San Fran um, for one, I mean, to Sacramento for one weekend. And we're going to go to San Fran for a couple of days. So I um, generously took him up on his offer, went out to Sacramento. We spent the night, went to San Francisco, met his friends, went out to dinner, and I immediately got annihilated. Um, a day and a half of that, he was about done with me. Um, in fact, he left me there. He took my luggage and left me in San Francisco and went back to Sacramento. I had no money. Um, I had a backpack that he didn't know that I had with my airline ticket. It was underneath my bed. And I proceeded to stay annihilated for two or three days. Um, as we do, or as I do, as an addict, alcoholic, I manipulate. So I called back home, convinced my mother to send money, Western Union, other people to do so. As soon as I got the money, you know exactly what I did. I drank it up. Um, not really concerned about how and when it was going to get back. It was all going to work out like it always does. Over those next two days, I remember sleeping in city parks. I remember um, policemen poking me, like you t take those stairs down, like where you keep your garbage in San Francisco, and the house is up, and then the garbage is down here, and hey, you can't sleep here. And it didn't dawn on me until today, why didn't I just go to the baths? You know, why didn't I just take my money and go, go to the bathhouse and stay there? At least it would have been so really safe. Um, I ended up getting um, money for the last time, ended up in a bar over on uh, Castro, and I was, um, I really probably had a look of hopelessness, hopelessness on my face, and some really, really, really good Samaritan said, what, what's going on? What's going through your head? What's, what's the situation? I don't even remember the guy's name. I don't remember anything other than he took me back to his house. He was a gentleman. He got me showered. He got me fed. He put me to bed. The next morning, he got me up, called a cab, um, paid for the cab and the cab driver, and said, make sure he gets on the plane. And um, I still don't even know who this person was, even today. Um, there have been several people like that in my life that have been guardian angels, and I will never, ever, ever, if I live to be 100, ever forget the kindness that that gentleman showed me. I made it back. Um, it didn't change my demeanor at all. I continued to um, drink and bartend until um, they would fire me and yada, yada. Um, my next lead-off relationship is somebody that I met in a bar. And um, he was a flight attendant with America, and he drank like I did. And, um, you know, misery loves company. Um, the first weekend we were together, um, I said something about New Orleans. I remember us being at JR's, and I woke up the next morning, and we were kind of New Orleans. And I thought, I like this guy already. So um, we stayed there for a couple of days, and needless to say, when we came back, um, we were kind of joined at the hip. The thing about what I'll call DW is that um, he had this way about him that I never understood. He was a functioning, and I do mean functioning alcoholic. He worked the same job with the same airlines for over 35 years, never missed a day, never bounced a check, never missed a deadline. But he'd get up in the morning, the day that he would have to be on a flight, um, put on a pot of coffee, and the coffee would be to wake him up, and the beer would be to take away the jitters. And um, it, 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 it always blew my mind. How could he do that? Because here I'd lost jobs and got DWIs, and all these things were huge ripple effects of the wake of disaster I left in my, my, my world. And here's this guy that could do his whole life and just live his life without alcohol affecting him. And the, the thing is, is that we're two different people. I'm an alcoholic through and through. And he's an alcoholic, but it doesn't affect his world. So um, 
I moved out with him to Hawaii. We lived out there for three years. Um, embarrassing enough to say, um, I was voted off the island, and I don't mean I was voted off the island by him. I, um, I had um, a binger that lasted almost a week, and I was like higher than a kite, and um, let's just call it domestic abuse. And over there, domestic abuse holds the same thing as like DWI does here now. And the judge had me in jail for three days, and when I came up um, for court, he said, we're going to give you an option here. If you leave the island and don't come back for, you know, whatever, next couple of years, what have you, he said, you know, we'll drop the charges. So I eagerly agreed and kissed, said sayonara, aloha, whatever, to Hawaii and came back, sayonara. Um, when I moved back, um, I met another person in a bar. Um, this is the, that turned out to be my bestie, um, Leonard. Um, God love him. You know, there's so many people I, I talk about in my story that were guardian angels that literally came into my life for a purpose. And I think he was just one of those amazingly, really cool, cathartic, spiritual people that saw the good in me when I wasn't drinking, that that was worth taking a shot on. So he opened up his house to me and said, you can sleep on my couch. Shortly thereafter, you know, I kind of slept in the bed with him. We didn't do anything. We we're just friends. But at the same time, he had best, his bed, bet my best interest at heart. He knew that I wanted to get sober and that I had, had uh, tried getting sober, but um, I wasn't successful at it. So I made him an agreement that I would um, go back to AA. So I went to 2727 uh, Oak Lawn. Um, I remember seeing a lot of people that are in this room over there. Um, I remember distinctively seeing this big purple wall, it's called the God Wall, and all the people, the, big, the most sobriety set on that wall, those are the special people. I was the newcomer that sat on the smoker side, all the Kelly Green and the rest of the, the sinners. Um, I remember hearing Stocky tell her story. I remember King Solomon. I remember Harry. I remember, I think um, there were so many faces and so many people from that day that I remember. And I really, really, really wanted what I was hearing. Um, was I willing to get it? I just, I, I, I was kind of on board. So we put together like six months here, three months there, a year there. And um, my partner at the time was a ex-Marine, ex-cop who was very mentally and physically abusive. And it was really hard because I'm trying to get sober, he wasn't. He was trying to get sober, I wasn't. We were never seemed to be on the same page. And it just made for a recipe for a sucky relationship. So um, we ended up moving in together shortly after he hit me with the car. Literally, we were leaving a bar. And I jumped out, we're in an argument. And I'm walking away. And he hits the gas and runs over me. And I thought, oh, it's love. I'm going to move in with him. <laughs> so I did. Um, for seven years, seven years of torture, and um, when I got my third DWI, yes I did, um, I remember thinking the gig is up. Third, three, three DWIs at that point in time is a felony, and um, they want to put you in prison. And I thought, hmm, there's soon to be consequences. I'm starting to see something happen from all this. So I went back to AA again, and um, I was really trying to get it, and um, they gave me five years probation on that DWI, the third DWI. Um, I did get involved. I remember cleaning up the room and emptying ashtrays and uh, making a shitload of meetings and um, really trying. Dan, Dan D was, or Dan T was my, my sponsor at that time, and um, I was really earnestly trying to get this deal and to really I think one of the biggest challenges for me was that, you know, step one says we're powerless over alcohol, that our lives, lives have become unmanageable. And the hardest thing for me to do was to look in the mirror and think, you are an alcoholic. Because to me, an alcoholic was somebody that had no job. They had shitty clothes. They, they slept in a the gutter. They got up every morning and drank booze out of a bottle. I had this whole idea and concept of what an alcoholic was. It wasn't me. I had some things happen, sure. Who didn't? I was just a kid. So what? Um, but after this third one, I remember King Solomon pulling me aside and saying, you know what, they're, 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 they're kind of getting done with you. So I stayed sober for four years. Um, at the end of that little four-year, almost five years, I got my fourth DWI. I was in my uh, husband's car that didn't have the blow machine on it, and they pulled me over, and um, I knew the gig was up. This is the blow machine. Um, back then, 
They were a little bit more maneuverable, meaning that you could blow into it when you first got the car started, and that's all you had to do in every 45 minutes after that. So I figured that I could get anybody from a wino, hey, here's 20 bucks, blow into this. Well, how much booze have you had? Ah, no, you haven't drank it, come blow in the car and I'll give you some money and send you on your way. So everybody was always up for, for blowing, blowing my car. Um, <laughs> oh, that's not the blowing the car picture. This is actually me when I was driving drunk. Um, and this is the blowing the car picture. Um, this is what I look like when I drink and drove. This is one of the most scariest pictures I have in my collection of, of pics. And I show this to you to show the seriousness of my disease. My eyes look like slits. I'm barely, barely coherent. And I'm driving 65, 70 miles an hour down, thir down 35. This is my life. Uh, when I got my fourth DWI, um, which was shortly thereafter, I was six months from getting off my, my third DWI, and um, I got a fourth. And um, I really knew at that time the gig was up, again, again. And um, it wasn't a matter of if or how long, it was just a matter of when and what. And for whatever reason, at the last hour they came back and they were aiming for 10 years um, in the state penitentiary. And um, I wasn't rich, I didn't have my family's money or anything to back me up, but for whatever reason they gave me 30 days work release and tacked another 10 onto my probation. And um, I thought it was kind of a blessing, but going through that whole rigmarole after almost five years and then having another 10 tacked onto that was like almost murder, but I didn't. I pissed in their cup. Um, a lot of humiliating circumstances, had to go to jail, uh, spend the night there for 30 days, which was, really wasn't that big a deal. Consequences, but were they major enough to get my attention? Eh. But it did work. It did work because in March 23rd of 98, I established a new sobriety date. And when I say I got involved, my fourth day DWI got my attention. Um, I managed to establish a sponsor. Again, like before, I was engaged in all the meetings. Everyone I hung out with was in AA. Um, my litter mates, a lot of them are still sober today. Um, God, back then we did everything together. They put an ad of a little piece of paper of something going on up on the bulletin board and everybody would show up. It was the most badass thing. Um, and I liked it. I really, I liked being a part of AA. Um, a lot of good things came out of that 11 and a half years of sobriety. Um, my son is one of them. Um, uh, Kevin, a girl that goes to Lambda, or did go to Lambda at the time, um, asked me to be a, a, a dad to, to her kid. And when you grow up a gay man, I think the ones that do and want kids, that's the biggest blessing of all. I'm gonna start crying here in a moment. Um, I never thought in my lifetime, and being an alcoholic and all the things that I've been through, that somebody would approach me about being a dad. And uh, I was kind of skeptical at first. I was like, look around, there's guys in here that are better looking, guys that are more successful, guys that have their shit together. But at that time, I think I had like six or seven years, and um, it was a discussion thread one day at a reality the next. Out of all the things that came out of this, this program, I think that is the biggest gift that I can say today, um, is that, that gift of, of my son. Um, you know, we're afforded a lot of things in sobriety, and um, as time goes on, I think, for me, I prioritize different things, and sobriety was such a huge focus for me. And then I met my ex-husband, and all of a sudden I made him the pinnacle of my existence. Um, I put him up on a pedestal, which is my, I, I, my, I take up ownership for that. And um, I started letting my meetings slip away. If there's anything that anybody hears out of my story today, or this evening, is that um, it's important not to let that happen, because each and every time I seem to get a little bit of sobriety, you know what, I got this. Um, you know what, um, it's just a day, it's just a week without a meeting, it's just two weeks without a meeting, oh, I can call my sponsor later, oh, you know what, I can, and just you're, you're, you start listening to these voices that are present still. Um, and um, for me, I just kept pushing them down, pushing them down, pushing them down. Um, no relationship is perfect, and my ex husband and I had issues and problems, and um, like anyone does. And um, during one particular instance, I'd gone on a business trip to Austin, and um, I had um, gone to the central market to buy a salad and a bottle of water and take it back to my room. And um, 
For whatever reason, I was thinking, you know what? Wine sounds really good. I, actually, I wanted a beer because I was more of a beer drinker, but I said, oh, let me get a thing of wine. And I was really, really, really thinking strong and long and hard about it, but I thought, eh, I'm not going to do it. And then sure enough, here I'm buying this bottle of wine. I took it to my little room and got back there. No fucking wine opener. What do you figure? That was a God thing. Um, I found a way to get the damn thing open anyway, as you know, not true alcoholic would. And I took one little glass out of it, and the, the guilties got me. I, I really started thinking about what I was doing, about all that sobriety I'd, I'd piled up and all those meetings I had shared, how many times I spoke from the podium, um, things I had talked about, and I, I really felt bad about what I did. So I poured it down the, the, the toilet. Um, the sad thing was when I came back, I was not honest, and I did not own up to my slip or my relapse. And in this program, we say you're only as sick as your secrets, and that's the gospel. I really believe that you're only as sick as your secrets. So I came back, here I've got this failing relationship, marriage. Um, I'm holding on and harboring this secret about me drinking, and I didn't get honest with anybody. So y'all can kind of take it from there on the next trip out, business trip out, um, the same thing happened. I went out for dinner that night. In intentionally, I had a drink and um, walked back to my hotel and nothing happened. And you can kind of get the snowball effect from there. It seemed like every business trip out, it would be every three months or two months or six months. And I kept moving the marker. It went from no drink to drinking at the hotel bar to drinking out at a restaurant to, oh, gee, I can drink at the airport on the way back. And then before you knew it, I was getting into Dallas and having a drink at the airport there before I was going home. Um, all these things that I, I, you know, I had created this, 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 this area of gray and the black and the white. And the, the, the black and white was drink, don't drink. And then all of a sudden, these areas of gray, I kept making larger and larger and larger and giving myself carte blanche to why it was okay to drink. Um, I was becoming a little um, sloppy. Um, I lost a couple of jobs that I really, really cared about. Um, my husband found out I was drinking. I found out he was doing something else. So um, you do you, I'll do me. Um, we decided we were going to divorce, and um, that was that. Um, funny thing about wishing other people ill will or harboring resentment. They say resentment is our number one offender, and it truly, truly is, or it is for this alcoholic. Um, I just thought, you know what? When we divorce, um, I will show you. I will get even with you. Um, I hope that things that you made me feel, well, you'll feel the same pain. And um, you can't wish that off on somebody else because it, it, it ends up in nothing. Um, it took two and a half years, and um, it ended up in a really bad situation um, on December January the 9th, and I'm going to start crying. January 9th of 2010, um, I had gone out for a pack of cigarettes, like you hear people do. I'm just going to run down the street and get a pack of cigarettes. I've been on a three-day binge. Um, I could barely assimilate a word, but yet I was going to go down the street and get some cigarettes. And um, my husband, who was supposed to be one of us, didn't stop me. It's not up to him to be my keeper. So I jumped in the car, and I went down the street to get a pack of smokes. And um, keep in mind, you know, I... Um, Got off my last 40, fourth DWI um, felony probation. Um, I had no long arm of the law finally looking over me. And I'm thinking I've got this thing licked and how different it's going to be this time. And it wasn't different at all. Um, I got on a road going toward my old house, toward a cliff, and um, a motorcyclist um, threw a beer bottle at my car. And I guarantee it's probably to get my attention um, for, well, probably almost running them over. And um, I went chasing after them, and motorcycles are very agile, and they're able to maneuver pretty quickly. And um, when you're inebriated and chasing somebody 70, 80 miles an hour down a two-lane street, you're not. And I jumped over the median, and I hit another car head-on. Um, this is what's left of that Mercedes. Um, inside that car was a lady and her two children. And I have thought long and hard about um, where they were going that night, how they were just doing their thing, enjoying their evening. And here, in just a, a blink of an eye, I changed their life. Um, I remember the cars colliding. I remember the, 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 the white light. And I kept thinking in my head, if this is dying, I hope that I just go quickly. I had drugs in my pocket. 
Um, I remember reaching in after the impact, and they said, he's got something in his pocket, he's got something in his pocket, he's eating it. And I was hoping that whatever had happened and me eating what I had in my pocket would just push me over the edge and I would die. I woke up um, hours later, strapped to a gurney in the emergency room. Um, there was a policeman standing at the door. I've got my soon-to-be ex-husband standing at the end of the bed along with um, my mom and a couple of other people, and they're looking at me with uh, very sad eyes, and I'm thinking, somebody say something. I just wanted to know what is going on. Could somebody please tell me um, what's up? And um, they said, everybody's okay, but um, it wasn't good. Um, you hit, and they explained what, it, what, what had gone on. It was shortly thereafter that I had heard um, that I had um, injured the young girl, and she had her spleen removed. Um, another girl had a broke arm and a broke leg, and the mom wasn't surprisingly injured at all. As a parent, um, I totally understand the chaos that I put in their life, and I knew this particular time that the, the gig is finally up. Um, when I was well enough, which was only a day and a half later, they, they don't keep crooks or criminals um, in any sort of medical area. They moved me to Lou Sterrett, and surprisingly enough, um, within a day and a half, my mom and ex-husband and other people put up my bail, which is very substantial, and they got me out of jail. Um, this allotted me and afforded me a huge grace area to get my affairs together before my court date and before me going away because I knew I was going to prison. Um, I was able to stay out um, almost a year. My uh, charges were intoxication assault with a deadly weapon uh, times three. The car was a deadly weapon and they thought by giving me the most strenuous sounding offenses um, that they would carry more weight. I also got tampering with evidence which was later dropped. That was me eating whatever that it was that I had. Um, I remember the day of the court um, very, very clearly. Um, Chris Hill was there, Chris H was there. There was a couple of other people that were supportive in there. And um, I remember sitting there listening to the, one of the young girls, the older one and her mom sitting there terrorizing me or terrorizing, just telling their stories, what they were doing and explaining how they were you know, headed back from a movie and how I had just intentionally and maliciously got behind the wheel of a car with the intention of intentionally killing them and um, that I was a habitual and I had had four DWIs and I no longer needed to be a member of society. Um, they drug me away, and I remember this was the beginning of the end. I want to say the night before that, I had been um, really contemplating taking a shitload of pills. I'd had a bunch of pills I'd had set aside for a long time, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to, this will be the night just to finally do what I wanted to do all along, which is when I drank, I just thought, you know what, I don't belong on planet Earth. I just was so angry at myself. I just wanted to disappear. I chose not to take the pills, and I chose to take responsibility, and I, I, I couldn't fathom thinking putting that pressure on my son for him wondering um, exactly who, what, and why I did that. Um, to say that prison was a game changer, it was literally the game changer deluxe. Um, I would hear people in there probably say, you know, they've been to prison two or three times, so I thought, who the fuck would want to be here, you know, once, let alone two or three times. But when I say it was the, the game changer for me, it was really the game changer um, I've heard also had people say, you know, when you're in prison, it's an easy place to get drugs. You can get, or, or like, it's an easy place to stay sober. And on the contrary, it was a place to where you could make your own booze, and um, there were drugs available that you could get anything you wanted in prison. And the case that I had, you're housed by your, your offense. And I was intoxication assault, I was in there with killers and things like that, murderers. And um, I was in there with the big guns. Um, there was another nickname in there. They called me Linus early on because I would hide out of my bed with a little blanket and I wouldn't come out. Some guy in there said, dude, you can't do your time that way. So he suggested a Bible study. And I'll condense this because I'm running out of time. Um, he suggested I do a Bible study, and I did. And that Bible study got me out of my head. Long of the short is um, I was approached by the chaplain, who's the, the head church guy in prison, and he said, hey, uh, my um, chaplain clerk is leaving. Um, I figure you're the guy to come work for me. And, I'm like, where did you hear this? Everybody's saying you're the one. And I'm thinking, like, there's a million and one guys here in prison, um, a lot that know the word better than me and um, more fit, proficient than me. They have a better walk. And P.S., I'm gay. I'm not the one. And um, he said, no, you're, you're, you're really who I would like for me to come work um, for me. And um, 
A couple of days later, he came in and gave me a job change. And um, when I say it was the most amazing thing that I did in prison, it really was. Out of that one gesture was the thing that kept me from being in places I shouldn't when all hell broke loose. When there were riots or things like that, I should have been over here, and yet I was over here. It afforded me a lot of um, maneuverability around the prison that the normal prisoners didn't have. Um, they keep you shuffled like a deck of cards in there, and when I say um, a miracle, I was moved to another place, and I got to this other facility, and um, one of the guys at the, um, my bunkie next door was saying, hey, you know, what did you do at the last facility? I said, Chaplain Guard, dude, that job's Cadillac. You should apply for it here. I'm like, how long have you been here? I've been here three years. How long has he had his chaplain clerk? Oh, two years. I'm like, then I'm not going to get the job. So he turned in a job thing on me, and sure enough, that guy let that guy go and um, hired me as a chaplain clerk. And the reason why I say this is that um, it was clear to me that God had a mission to keep me close to him inside that, th those four walls, inside that toxic, volatile, vile, um, racist environment. Um, God kept me by his side. And I promised him when I got out that I would do two things, and one of which is not turn my back on him like I did last time and get mad at him for things that were of my, my own doing. And the other thing was not to hold in or harbor the story and the walk and the journey that I've been on, that, that um, I would be doing myself a disservice for not sharing my story. I just want to say one last thing, too. Um, one of the biggest things I think um, was difficult for me in that whole prison sentence was that the first year was really difficult in the fact that I had been in AA all these years, you know, four years here, 11 and a half years, a year, um, and it took me a lot of time to, to just dissolve the fact that you need to find self-forgiveness, you need to give yourself a break, that you know what, you're an alcoholic, and when you drink, this is a byproduct of what happens. And you know when you get out, you can never stray far from the group again, because if you do, the same shit's gonna happen again. So I realized I've gotta continue sharing my story, I've got to elevate to you guys um, how important this thing is because it's no joke. Um, the, the, the stories that I'm telling are not, you know, I, I made light of, you know, uh, my childhood and some of the goofy stories of when I drank, but it, it tells a story that's, that's true and, and true, or tried and true is that um, when this alcoholic, when I drink, it may not be today, tomorrow, next week, or next year, but it's always going to turn out the same. And um, I think all of us are that way is that, that um, I hope we've all found that, you know, um, we're all just one step away from another drink. Um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm really, I, I never thought I would be able to say I'm a grateful, grateful to be an alcoholic, and I am. Um, I'm grateful to uh, share my story with you. I'm grateful to, to, there are days where I open my eyes and look up, and I'm just grateful that, you know what, I'm not in that shitty place anymore. Um, I got off parole this past year, and I'm free and clear to, to travel the world again. But um, the biggest thing is that I'm free from the slave or from the bonds of, of uh, or addiction. The, the bonds of addiction are um, just drinking and drugging in general. I don't get up with that whole mentality of I've got to use today. And when I do, I know what to do. I call Glenn. I, I reach out to people, and I utilize the resources that I neglected before. So um, I appreciate you guys listening. I'm running a little. Close on time, but thanks for listening to my story.